and welcome to a very exciting edition of Restless Presents. We are here with Lionel Shriver, who really needs no introduction, a widely published journalist. She's the author of 13, soon to be 14 novels, including the Orange Prize winner and international bestseller, We Need to Talk About Kevin. This was adapted for a feature film by Lynn Ramsey in 2011. Her novels have featured on bestseller lists across the world, including the Sunday Times and New York Times, and her work has been translated into 28 languages. Lionel writes for a range of British media, including The Times, The Guardian, and The Spectator, and is a regular commentator on TV and radio. Her latest novel, The Motion of the Body Through Space, has been described as enjoyably abrasive in the Evening Standard, scabrously funny in The Guardian, and pinpoint sharp in Women and Home. But it was a review in The Scotsman that really captured Lionel's essence. She writes bold and fearless comedy and delights in slaughtering the sacred cows of the stupid times we live in. Few novelists now raise a laugh. Shriver does so time and time again. Please welcome Lionel Shriver. Thank you so much for joining us, Lionel. It's a huge honor to have you with us. Um, before we go into some of the questions from our audience, we wanted to find out a bit more about the motion of the body through space and what prompted you to focus on what you call the cult of fitness. Well, first of all, uh, it's, I mean, it's been going on for at least 20 years, if not 40, but throughout my life, uh, the West's obsession with fitness has uh, constantly accelerated until more recently, it, it would qualify as obsessive. And I, I start out just as somebody who in um, childhood and early teens, got into fitness in a very private way. Um, and it didn't just didn't have to do with anybody else aside from playing tennis. You know, that does require one, at least one other person. But um, otherwise it was just my business. And then suddenly the rest of the world kind of took over that space as we put it these days. And um, I resented it a little bit. And that's irrational because, of course, we should want each other to be healthy and and to, you know, enjoy our, our bodies and and be strong. You know, it's good for everyone and especially for women, you know, who used to embrace being very weak and frail and delicate to now want to have a six pack just like the men is probably uh, healthy in another sense. Um, but I'm very territorial. That's one of the reasons I did a, a short story and novella collection called Property. <laughs> and uh, I felt a little crowded. And that's something that my protagonist and I share. In fact, I gave her a history of a series of little private fascinations um, that suddenly become popular and they're not the same anymore because they don't only belong to her. And I think that that's a, a fairly commonplace experience. You know, if nothing else, you know what it's like, uh, you have a book and nobody else has ever heard of it. Uh, and then suddenly it's turned into a movie and it's, it's not your special discovery anymore. It's, and, and you feel a little robbed. It's interesting that um, the protagonists are a couple in their 50s and 60s. Do you think that this obsession with exercise extends to all age groups? Was there a particular reason why you chose this age group rather than, say, a couple in their 20s or 30s? Well, the um, characters in all the age groups, really, um, not kids, I guess, but... Uh, one of the reasons I did try to spread, spread the age, ages out is that I think one of the things that's interesting about this particular societal obsession is that it crosses generations. Um, the older people may be more uh, ha having an eye to fitness as a route to uh, immortality, um, to keep from getting sick. Uh, whereas uh, younger people are uh, more oriented toward uh, earning status, you know, competing with each other and, and showing a, a sense of, of, of superiority that your running time is faster or you run farther than your mates. Um, 
Although the status thing is also with older people at all, they're as well, they're just as competitive as younger people about their running times. And um, I guess the, what I mostly wanted to ask the reader to do in relation to uh, fitness is to get a grip and keep it in proportion. I think uh, this is also something that makes a lot of us miserable because we never feel we're doing enough. And there's always somebody who's, who's more impressive than we are or, um, and, you know, oh, we think we're a little overweight and we had, you know, you know how unhappy that makes people. Uh, and for me, uh, it's really a mechanical issue. I mean, it, there, there's, there are kind of, there's some spiritual elements to it in that, you, you know, the, getting yourself to do something you don't want to do is hard and forcing yourself to, you know, do that one more repetition or to, to run that w one more mile that has to do with the, com uh, the command of, of mind over body, which has a certain complexity to it and in is interesting, but it's only so interesting. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you're just trying to keep the machine working. You're dependent on the machine working to be alive at all. And what makes your body important is that it, it, it works and that it keeps you alive. And it's the interior that is still important. And, and um, you know, and there are occasions when you find that out in a kind of forbidding way. If you get in an auto accident, you discover just how much you don't want to be only your body. You know, you, so, you know, I'm, the, the book is not anti-exercise and it's actually occupies a kind of interesting little philosophical area because it's just anti-fanatical exercise um, in, in a way that can take over your whole life. And because, you, you know, for those of you who haven't read it, it's about a marriage where the, uh, the husband who has never, you know, done more than climbed a a flight of stairs before um, suddenly becomes interested in running a marathon and later he becomes obsessed with doing a triathlon and he becomes utterly unbearable and it so much so and he becomes so narcissistic so self-involved so negligent of other people in his life that he endangers the marriage so do you from a personal perspective um your own relationship with exercise. We've had a question through from Eddie um, who says, experts say we need to do 10,000 steps a day to achieve a healthy weight. Has Lionel ever tried to achieve this? Or do you have any kind of, of that structure? Or do you, as you say, find this kind of obsessive obsession with exercise unhealthy and that we all just do our own things rather than be guided by particular goals such as that? Um, well, maybe this is going to make me sound like a hypocrite. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time. Um, I exercise every day and I exercise a lot every day. So, and by the way, I just made lots of people hate me because um, that's what's so interesting about this whole area. It's, it's the source of so much neurosis and resentment and competition and suspicion. And I mean, it's so emotional. That's one reason it makes good fiction. Um, but yeah, I have a, a routine. It has uh, had to uh, change through the years a little bit because, and I use this in the book, uh, I have completely destroyed my knees. I have not, like my character eventually does, had my knees replaced, but I should have done many years ago. And so um, like in 2015, I had to give up running, which, uh, well, that was an ambivalent experience because on the one hand, um, I'd done it uh, since I was 14 years old and it was really kind of grim to admit that I was doing myself more harm than good. But on the other, I think I was sneakily glad to get out of it. <laughs> so, 
Um, so yeah, to be honest, one of the reasons I wrote this book and one of the reasons I'm qualified to write this book is that I have been, um, I don't want to say fanatically uh, addicted to fitness my whole life, but it's been a regular discipline. Um, all I would qualify is it's, uh, it's not my favorite part of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad when it's over. Okay. We've had another question on the exercise front, just asking if you've had any kind of reaction from Ironman or the triathlon community. Um, and this is from someone who, who's, who's in that, involved in that um, regular participant in triathlons and so on. So this person said they felt like they knew all the characters from your personal, from her personal experience. So have you had any, any kind of reaction from? people who are sort of fanatics, I suppose. You know, funnily enough, I haven't. Um, and I think there may be a subsection of people involved in endurance sports, you know, the triathlon, the mar marathon and everything that may be a little averse to reading this book. I mean, first off, it's not, it's not a book that idolizes uh, the participation in these sports and why would you invite that kind of skepticism into your life if if you're devoted to an activity which requires an enormous amounts of effort and time and sometimes sacrifice and pain you don't want to be told that it's excessive and uh and isn't really noble it's just you know okay, fine, that's your idea of fun, but don't expect us necessarily to admire you. That's not what you want to hear. And I also think there's a little, there is a territorial element. It's like that belongs to me, that's mine. I, I don't want to read someone else writing about it. Uh, I think people can be strangely possessive about that kind of activity. So yeah. rather conspicuously, I have not heard from people who, <laughs> who do endurance sports. That's interesting. Well, another of our member has asked, in your book, you talk about what you don't like about the modern world. Are there any aspects of the modern world that remain of particular value to you? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> That's a broad question, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. I do spend a lot of time um, complaining um, <laughs> in, directly or in, indirectly. Uh, you know, the fact that we can't, you know, despite the pandemic, we can still communicate through this medium is kind of thrilling. It's not as good as doing in-person events, which I love doing, um, but I'm grateful that we can communicate at all. Um, you know, just despite all the many sources of darkness uh, in the world, I still love to read. I am I love good uh, video entertainment and I'm happy to live it in a time when I can get Netflix, you know, <laughs> terrific. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, however much turmoil we live through and however much, you know, political polarization and disagreement, and I don't need to tell you everything that happens in the world. I still have great friends. Most people I meet are reasonable and warmly disposed towards others. And that hasn't changed. So mm -hmm. we tend to focus, and I tend to focus, I admit, on um, the more extreme elements, people who are difficult and shrill and stupid. But, uh, <laughs> but that's not the majority. And I, I, I still haven't had my faith in the human race completely shattered. Well, it's, it's interesting you touched on politics there because we've had a question saying, how do you think the US has weathered um, the Trump presidency? Well, I think it's pretty that? obvious that uh, the US came out the other side. I mean, there were a lot of Democrats claiming that Trump would have ruined uh, American democracy forever. And I think that's demonstrably untrue. Uh, I think he, he certainly had a role in shifting some norms. Biden's busy trying to shift them back. Um, you can never 
un-Trump American history. So we have now demonstrated that we are capable of electing someone who, in my personal view, was unqualified for uh, the office of the presidency. That, uh, and, and if we can do it once, we can obviously do it again. So in that sense, uh, the US will not be the same again. And I think there's a, a way in which Trump diminished uh, the country in the eyes of the world. Um, and while you can say that the government and, and the people are not the same, the people elected the government. So in some ways, we, we also besmirched the reputation of the American people. Moving from a less politicized question to, um, we wanted to hear a bit more about your actual writing process. We've got Julie asking, how long did it take you to get your first book published and how easy or difficult was it to do so? Well, my very first book uh, has never been published. I, um, I wrote a, a, a novel that of course, once I finished it, I thought was great. <laughs> Doesn't one always. Um, and uh, I sent it a few places I, to, to agents and didn't get any takers. And I, I actually, I, I had other names I could have sent, sent it out further, but I really came to the conclusion that I could write a better book. And I was right. And that was probably my first act of maturity as a writer is to say, well, look, fine, that was good practice. I've proved to myself that I can complete a full length manuscript, um, but this is not doing me any favors, I can do better. And I was very fortunate, in fact, looking back, that that book never saw print because, I mean, I, I was under aware of it at the time, but um, when you write a debut, that's what it is, it's a debut. Um, and if it's poorly received, then you can, uh, basically stop yourself from publishing anything else for the rest of your life. You know, you've given yourself a bad reputation and you're not going to get another crack at it. In fact, I'm, I'm relieved now looking back at my, what is now regarded as my first novel, that I was not that aware of that, that I didn't realize how much was at stake in the first book. And also, you know, I look back at how long it took me to sell that book, the female, which is called The Female of the Species. Uh, and I think I had a pretty easy time of it. I uh, it sent it to like four agents before somebody picked it up. It went to a handful of publishers before um, Random House picked it up. So that made it, um, I mean, in, in today's terms, that's, that's extraordinary. I'll tell you what, I do not envy uh, young writers today about, and that's, you know, it seems like it's very uh, convenient to be able to submit manuscripts to agents uh, by uh, email. But it, the trouble is that that means that all your competition has access to the same comp convenience. And that means agents are swamped with manuscripts in a way that they weren't in, um, when, when I was a young writer, because you had at that time to photocopy, uh, you know, four or 500 pages. It was very expensive. The postage was expensive. If you wanted your manuscript back, that was more money because you had to include a self-addressed stamped envelope. And so, you know, you might send out at most four or five manuscripts at a time, and now you can literally send out hundreds. And it's, it, it, it turns out to be a catastrophe. Uh, my, my younger brother wrote a couple of books and sent, his, sent at least one of them out to about 70 different agents. And, you know, hardly ever got any response. It was soul destroying. So I'm really, really sympathetic with how hard it is to break through to uh, agents with a good reputation or mainstream publishers. It's just, it's a nightmare. 
It's interesting about your first book. Would you ever, we've had a question from someone asking, would you ever revisit it? Would you ever perhaps redraft it, rewrite it and, put, and look to get it published now? Or is that consigned, it, consigned to the bottom of a drawer somewhere? <laughs> it's not only in the bottom of the drawer, it's up in the attic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? I have no interest even in rereading it, much less in publishing it. I did. I trust my memory that it's it was wide of the mark. So no, I mean, yeah, I, I, I that would that would be a big mistake. Okay. <laughs> well, one of our members has asked, "Do you plan everything out before you put your finger to the keyboard?" And actually, do you ever write longhand? You know, I used to write longhand. I wrote my first draft longhand um, through my fifth novel, um, or not quite through my fifth novel. That was the novel where I just got impatient with it because I got used to using the computer for everything else I wrote. And the physical writing just started seeming awkward. And it was, I mean, I had a whole, system of little symbols um, to make insertions and and revisions, but it was inefficient. And so I gave it up. I still have those physical manuscripts. Uh, I My writing was almost illegible then. I don't think I, it, it's completely illegible now. So I, I don't even think I would physically be capable of doing it. Um, the other, um, the other question was whether I plan out my novels, and yes, I do. Um, not every chapter, not every little character, uh, but I know the general arc of the book. I usually know roughly where I want to land, what the ending is, um, and and I know the major events. Uh, and some people's think that means that there's no sense of discovery, that it ruins the spontaneity, and I assure you that it doesn't. Because having plans is one thing and executing them is another. So the, the blank page never use, loses its forbidding quality. Uh, and it's, you know, ideas, ideas are formless, nothing, you still have to make it happen on the page. And that's plenty exciting. And that's, uh, that's plenty uh, rife with the possibility for failure. So- That actually I, ties in really nicely to our next question, which was mm -hmm. what gave you courage to become an author? Because as you say, it's a, by far uh, an easy task. And how, how do you balance your, your life with the need to write? You mean my regular, going to the supermarket, seeing friends life with the need to write. I mean, yes. I'm, I'm fortunate enough that since I make a living writing, uh, this life balance thing is not a big issue. And also I haven't had kids, so I've never had to, you know, make cheese sandwiches in the middle of chapter three. Um, uh, so I, I, that's just not an issue for me. I think that is a big issue for people who have day jobs and are trying to fit in time to work on the weekends and evenings and also may have a family. And I, you know, congratulations if you're able to pull that off. It's, but um, going back to where you first, when you first started in terms of that, that courage we just touched, touched on and, and not knowing that you were going to be a huge success at that, at that point, was that you, you immediately sort of started as an author with, well, were you juggling another role at the same time or how did you get sort of into it initially? Oh, well, I mean, I wanted to be a writer since I was seven. You know, basically once I learned to read, I, I, I wanted to write. Um, and and I, I have to say, I've been pretty single-minded about that my, my whole life. So, um, you know, it was a partly a logistical matter. Uh, when I first started out, I obviously wasn't going to be able to make a living doing it. And that's the main reason I ended up getting a Master of Fine Arts was to be able to teach. So I, um, 
for several years, I taught at uh, a variety of New York universities, teaching all those crappy beginning courses that nobody else wanted to teach, you know, freshman composition, sometimes remedial English. Um, actually, it was the remedial English classes that I thought were the most useful. As a matter of fact, all those courses, which were really about teaching the technical aspects of writing, I, I think were uh, far more satisfying because I think I was performing a real service than any of the creative writing I, uh, teaching I've done, which I tend to dislike. Partly, it just doesn't feel that useful. And the other thing I did uh, when I was in my 20s that a lot of people are unaware of is I ran my own catering business for 10 years. Now that's hard work. That's <laughs> the hardest work on the planet. So, um, and it, it, that dovetailed pretty well with writing because it was concentrated work. So, you know, I would, I would cook solid for three days and not get any sleep uh, and do the event and collapse. And then, you know, I could take the next week off and, and work on whatever I was writing. So it's actually a, a good combination of, of activities. Also the, the cooking is, it has nothing to do with language. It's physical. It's a, it's a, it's a complete apples and oranges. And I, I think, I think that's good. And I, I would say that, that I would recommend a job that has a physical aspect. And, and it's also a good way just to learn about the world. Uh, I learned about the materials involved in cooking and how to make, make things work, especially at scale. And then of course, then you deal with the customers and their guests. And that's another way to find out about, about the world. And uh, that's not always a pleasant discovery, <laughs> but it's interesting. We've had a, a, a couple of comments from um, our members about how you're very fearless in your writing, not afraid to say um, say anything really, and you create characters who can be very hard to love, but obviously draw the reader in. Um, particularly, do you feel that you're always referenced as the author of We Need to Talk About Kevin, which is obviously one of the most disturbing, well, from my perspective anyway, one of the most disturbing characters you've written about in the is that something you you kind of like to make people feel uncomfortable in your writing, or is it just just the work, just your technique, or do you find it, it it engages people to to read about something that they find more challenging? I don't think I purposefully make readers feel uncomfortable. Um, and as for being fearless. Uh, I think I may, it may be more a matter that I tend to forget that what I write all by myself in my study, other people are likely to read subsequently. In other words, I feel that I am writing something in, in, in a state of privacy and it's just between me and myself. And that serves my interest, so I don't fight it. Uh, it, it is not helpful to feel that there are people looking over your shoulder while you're typing. And, uh, you know, so I use that sense of being all by myself and pleasing myself and making myself laugh um, and entertaining myself. I mean, that's, that's really what's going on most of the time. I'm amusing myself. And then, then I just don't delete it all. <laughs> <laughs> so then, I, then, then this delusional sense of safety uh, gets misinterpreted as fearlessness. Do you um, know when you're writing a book what whether it's going to be a bestseller? I mean, in particular, just going back to we need to talk about Kevin. Did you, when you were writing that, compared to some of your other novels, did you think this is this is going to be a big one? This is. Or do you have a sense? Well, actually, I just published a piece in The Guardian this last weekend uh, addressing exactly that point. And oh, okay. the, answer, the answer is no. I had no idea it was going to be a bestseller. In fact, when I wrote that book, I was at a low ebb and the book I'd written previous 
uh, had not been published at all. Nobody picked it up. Um, I didn't want to quit. It seemed like a babyish thing to do. It was only one book that hadn't been picked up and I had six others published. So it seemed sensible to soldier on, um, but I was kind of depressed and, uh, and uh, skeptical that the book I was writing then wouldn't meet the same fate, that nobody would pick it up. And I knew I was taking a big risk with the manuscript because it was about a mother who didn't love her own son. And that's just not a winning ticket, is it? I mean, who likes a person like that? This was the big rule in fiction that mothers love their sons. And it's funny because it's very specific to sons. They can have problems with daughters, but you love your sons through thick and thin, regardless of what they do. And um, so I was breaking one of the only remaining taboos. Yeah, I, you know, while I was writing it, I was also having a good time, you know, when the scenes were working, it uh, put me in a good mood. And um, I, and, and I, when I finished it, I did feel that it was successful in its own terms, but then my, my other books had felt the same way. So, and they hadn't turned into bestsellers. So why, why on earth would I assume that it was going to be a bestseller? And also my standards had dropped. I mean, I, I didn't even, I, I wasn't even thinking in those terms. I was wondering whether it would see print at all. That's what I was concerned with. Not how many hundred thousand copies I was going to sell. So I, I think that's instructive actually, that you can't anticipate how your work is going to be received. And that includes uh, finishing off a book that you're totally convinced is going to be a bestseller. You may be wrong. And when it was picked up to, to be turned into a film, as, as the author, your involvement in that whole process, were you pleased with the way it turned out? Or how much of a, I mean, obviously they're, they're working to the story in your book, but how much of a say do you actually have in terms of how the film turns out? Practically none. Right. You know, and that's partly a, a matter of a contract. You know, ask any other writer who's had a film turned into a book. And sometimes you are brought on board to help write the script or to write the whole script. I didn't want that role. Um, I don't like the idea of mucking in with old work uh, I thought that it was likely that a fresh eye would bring new life to the project. Um, and so I pretty much stayed out of it. There was a little bit of consultation with the director and that would have been early on. Uh, I think something happens in the process of adaptation when it's not the author doing the adaptation. Uh, Again, we're getting back to this territory thing. Uh, uh, I'm convinced that the director became possessive of the material and I was a rival for a deed to that material. And there was a point early on, she stopped communicating with me and we got on fine. You know, I think we liked each other, uh, but she wanted to make it hers. And, and she did make it hers. You know, and I think it's it's a it's a good movie. I would have done a few things differently. Uh, it's more visual and less verbal than I would have made it because I, you know, anybody who reads my books knows that I like a lot of dialogue, and I think that that film sings m most when the director used dialogue from the book. I mean, when when we combined forces. Um, it really turned into something splendid. So there are particular scenes that, that rise above. And it's because she's a very fine director. And my dialogue's pretty good too. <laughs> it's a great film and a great book. Um, on, the, on the books where you, well, like your first debut, debut novel, it, you've had a question um, from one of our members who says, what does it feel like to put so much effort into something and then to have it rejected? How do you pick yourself back up again and find the enthusiasm and confidence to try again? 
I mean, with difficulty. I'm very sympathetic with anyone who goes to the trouble of writing a whole book. And it's, it's not a small investment. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And, and in, some time, in some instances, you may have not just written the book, but rewritten it, carefully edited it, perhaps done a lot of research for it, and then nothing. And it's, it's profoundly discouraging. And what mostly kept me going was an idea for another book. You know, I, I got over uh, not being able to sell The New Republic. It was, subs that book was subsequently, subsequently published um, because I had an idea uh, uh, for uh, a book about one of these school killers written from the perspective of the killer's mother. And I thought that was a great angle on a story that at that time, nobody had written any novels about. And, uh, and I wanted to bring it to fruition. That, so it was re it's really just a positive desire to create something that I thought could be a successful artistic project. And that's probably the, the best way out of the pit of being completely depressed that you went to all this effort and, and you have nothing to show for it. We've had a question actually from someone who says, talks about the growth in self-publishing and how if you go onto Amazon, you can find uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of books which have been self-published. Do you think self-publishing is a, if you're an a, a, a aspiring author to kind of, keep you going to see something on the shelf? Sure, it's an option and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be down on that. Um, I would concede the limitations. I mean, there are a few instances uh, where people have been super successful and something just takes off, but we all know that that's not really the standard experience. For the most part, you put it up there, your friends and relatives download it or buy a copy and that's kind of it. Yeah. I don't think there is any substitute for recognition by your larger culture that it is of value to strangers. And so I would wish that for, for aspiring writers. And you know what ends up happening when a self-published book takes off? always uh, a, a mainstream publisher comes along and, and buys it and, and puts it out. And that's in spite of the fact that if such writers were to purely publish on Amazon, they'd make more money. And there may be a few instances where people decide, yeah, I'm gonna make more money. So I'm not gonna sell it to Penguin Random House. But I think by and large, the tendency is to make the sale. And I don't think that's financially driven. It's about getting that cultural rec recognition. You know, it, it's, it feels good. It feels like having arrived. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's thrilling. I mean, I, I, when I for, sold my first novel, I cried. And, and I don't apologize for that. It was something that I had waited for my whole life, and it was very moving. And I, I don't, I don't think it's the same experience when you see your book up on Amazon and you've self-published. It's so incredibly hard, though, as you were saying earlier about talking about your brother and how his attempts to to get books published. What would you? I mean, how do you break through that almost impossible? glass ceiling to get your name out there it's it seems so so difficult for aspiring authors nowadays um, well I have to confess I I'm I don't know you know I'm not going to be any help with it I <laughs> I, I uh, came of age as a writer uh, in a completely different era and you know it was before the internet mm -hmm. in other words it was primordial times <laughs> and um honestly I couldn't even help my own brother and I tried. 
I could not get him published. And that's, and you think, oh, it's all who you know and connections. His being connected to me didn't help. I, I, I could get him s some attention, but not acceptance. And it's just, so I don't know how it's done. And I think the best way to find out how it's done is to consult younger writers, writers who have prevailed in this technical and cultural landscape. Thank you. We've, we've had a, um, another question, which is, what do you think about the current obsession with identity? And also, what do you think about the notion that if you're not whatever your protagonist is, have you any right to be writing about them, even when it's fiction? Okay, well, I've gone on the record on this issue countless times. Um, yes, of course, you have a right to write from the perspective of anyone you want. That's one of the fun things about the occupation. Um, you may or may not be persuasive uh, in your inhabitation of that character. Uh, that's for the reader to judge. Um, I don't believe people own their own cultures. I think cultures overlap. I think we've gone, grown far too sensitive about this issue. Uh, I think the obsession with identity is tragic. I think it's a very limited way of looking at people, a reductive way of looking at people. I hate the way in trying to solve problems of uh, sex and gender and, and race, we've elevated these characteristics uh, to the top of the chart. And that's not what makes people in, important as individuals there uh, I mean honestly what would you think of me if I said you know that what's really important to me is being white it's just appalling well basically it's appalling across the board race is just an accident of birth it's a little vague as a category um, happily in my view lots of people are intermarrying between these groups and and the, the distinctions get fuzzier and fuzzier. Uh, I, I, I think that for a lot of people, this obsession with identity is well-meaning and is all about trying to bring about a greater so social justice, but I don't think it's resulting in greater social justice. I think it's just making us more race conscious, more afraid of each other, I mean, this whole thing of being afraid to write a, a, a protagonist uh, who's a little different than you, that's really a pity, you know, turning us all into scaredy cats. And I don't, you know, I don't want all my characters to be, you know, white women who were five foot two and were born in North Carolina. I mean, and do you want to read novels all of whose characters are just like that. I mean, it, it uh, as a limitation, it's in, it's in danger of driving us all to just write memoir because then we're on safe territory. That, that's, we, we know what we're talking about. We're not stabbing on anyone's toes. But I just reject out of hand the idea that if you create a, a, a fictional character who, who uh, maybe has a different skin color than you, that, that you are stepping on anyone's toes. And if, who owns the character? This is the big mistake. Whose character is that? It's your character. You made him or her up. Your character belongs to you. You can do with that character whatever you want without consulting you know, a sensitivity reader or something. It's, I just think we've, we've got too uptight. I did to resort to my 1960s upbringing. <laughs> and we need to relax, trust our imaginations and give us, be a little more forgiving. You know, it's true sometimes you're gonna write a character, maybe they're, they have a, a, a Hispanic background and you get something wrong, you know? Uh, well, okay, you got something wrong. It's not, not probably malicious, is it? you stand corrected. Maybe somebody can tell you, you know, that, that character's unlikely to eat that. 
But I mean, that's the other thing is that we're, we now think in terms of stereotypes. So if you create a character that, who doesn't play to a stereotype, then it's inauthentic. And, it, and it's damned if you do if you, and damned if you don't, because if it does play to stereotype, then you're playing to stereotypes. I mean, it's just like you, can't, you can't win. The whole argument is a dead letter and it's poisonous for fiction writing. And I can't wait to get past it. And do you feel, I mean, obviously there is so much feedback on everything that we all do, um, especially thanks to social media and um, criticism for people's opinions and views. And how do you avoid, uh, lots of people find that incredibly toxic reading that kind of criticism of their views. How do you deal with criticism of your opinions? Well, I ignore them. <laughs> um, I'm not on social media. I do not read the comments after my columns. Uh, in fact, that's a household rule. My, my husband is also forbidden from reading the comments. So I protect myself from other people's opinions. Partly because people are so vicious these days. So what good is that gonna do me? And I also find there's a lot of willful, willful misunderstanding. So, and that's, that's very discouraging, uh, especially when you're, you're writing nonfiction opinion pieces, like it's not a matter of literary interpretation. It's you're laying out what you think and, and then the takeaway for other people is something completely different. Well, if that just makes you feel, what was the point? Why, why did I bother to write that? Because, uh, because it, it, apparently that, that it reads as something completely other than I actually think. And that's depressing. So that, you know, too much interaction with the reader is that not actually in your interest. And especially in the current, uh, in the current atmosphere and opinion, journalism that I just push it out there and occasionally I'll hear from a friend of mine over email I, I liked your comment piece in the times fine that's the kind of that's the kind of response that I'm interested in and otherwise I just throw it out there I do a fortnightly column for the spectator um, occasionally I, I'm going to be pleased if my editor liked it <laughs> but Otherwise, you know, you can be drowned in other people's opinions. And the same goes for criticism of, of books. Uh, I, I don't seek it out too much. I mean, I'm not such a, a little wilted flower that I can't take reading a perhaps negative mainstream review in the New York Times or the Guardian or something. And I figure that it's generally good that I know that it's out there. But I don't sit there pouring over the reviews of my books in Amazon and Goodreads. It's, uh, it, it's, that is a sure route to a kind of self-consciousness that is potentially paralyzing. I've noticed with my husband, he, um, having been a little too overexposed before I stopped him to other people's responses to my opinions, that he's constantly saying, well, maybe you shouldn't write about that at all, or why shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't say that because it's gonna be misinterpreted as X, or, and I, I can see it, that if you keep trying to, anticipate how you might be criticized, then you just never write anything. Because there is an element of bravery, especially in opinion journal journalism. You just have to say it. And it's, it's the things that are tricky, that are difficult to say, that are a little dangerous to say, that are worth saying. The safe stuff is boring and there's no point in writing it or reading it. So, Yes, I take risks because otherwise I serve no purpose. 
a great answer. <laughs> and I, just going back to one of your books, um, we've had a question about the mandibles um, and how some of the concepts have almost turned out to be prophetic about the economic collapse of America and so on. Is, is that something that, I mean, that you sort of set out to do or is looking back, do you think any of those concepts were prophetic? Well, I'm certainly worried they're prophetic. I don't want them to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I want that book to be wrong. Um, none of us are going to be better off if the United States collapses economically. So that's, that's a typical example of writing a book about what I am personally afraid of. I am afraid, however, that uh, it, recent times have increased the likelihood that something like what happens in that book happens in real life. The, the kind of this making up of trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars from thin air is extremely dangerous. And, you know, we've, we've now got this boneheaded modern monetary theory, <clears throat> which basically posits you can make up as much money as you want, um, as long as you control the currency. And a country can just manufacture tons of money and then just give it to people and buy things. And does that's in violation of common sense. And I'm very suspicious of anything that violates common sense. You know, anything you make too much of is going to be reduced in value. That's just, that's just a rule of the market. And currency is no different. So I am very worried. Uh, there's this huge bubble in the stock market right now. And it's not quite half but it's uncomfortably close to half of the entire US budget is debt. And that really gives me the willies. So I emphasize, I don't want that book to predict the future, but, oh yeah, well, I mean, if it is, if it is prophetic, then I will be, uh, deeply disappointed and horrified uh, even though i might sell a few more copies nobody i won't sell that many more copies because nobody will be able to afford them um, <laughs> uh, although i should clarify that i think despite the from the sound of my description that that book is actually a lot of fun and sometimes very entertaining and which book would you say has been your favorite to write or do they all have their own, I'm sure they do have their own sort of enjoyment factor, but is there one in particular you, you especially enjoyed? Well, I loved writing The Mandibles. That, that was a very exciting project. And, and again, it was full of just my sitting around amusing myself successfully. Um, and the, the other book that I had a ball writing is my newest book, which comes out in June called Should We Stay or Should We Go? And that's, uh, that's a book that's about a, a couple who in their 50s decide that uh, life after about the age of 80 is not worth living. It's all downhill. So once they reach that age, um, they are going to commit joint suicide. And then lickety split in the book, of course, they turn 80. And what happens. So it's a parallel universe book. So that it looks at uh, 12 different outcomes that some of them going into science, science fiction. Um, and it was hilarious. I had, I know that sounds like a morbid premise, but the execution is very playful. And I had a wonderful time and I have never written a book faster in my life. I got a first draft in four months. Um, I miss it. I, uh, I, I wrote it too fast. Right now, I don't have a, a, an active manuscript on my computer, and it's making me utterly miserable. <laughs> when you were writing that book, did you have did you think which outcome you would like in your eighties? Well, of course, that's the whole game of the book. You know, which of these outcomes is palatable? And there's actually one chapter near the end, which is called. Uh, once Upon a Time in Lambeth. By the way, I said it in the UK. So um, my British readers, I hope, will uh, 
accept the compliment. Uh, and the, this w once upon a time in Lambeth is uh, is a fairy tale. It's it's actually a parody of what we we all hope for in our own our own old age. And uh, and little by little, it, it grows so absurdly rosy <laughs> that that it's that it's comical. Um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, if you had your choice, that's that's the one, that's the one you would choose. And at the very end of the chapter, it, it assures you that you know, for that finally the characters die, and it, and it says, fortunately, it turned out that there there were there was life after death after all. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want that one. <laughs> I think we all want that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you said you've got nothing um, planned at the moment, but how do you do you have any sort of ideas or? Oh, I have an idea, and I, I'm, I'm working on the outline and refining the characters. But planning a book is anxious and unsatisfying because um, the, the decisions are very important, and I'm always aware of that. But at the same time, planning is not executing, as we discussed earlier, and. I'm not actually, it, it, it feels like a kind of running in place. And it's only when, when the text, when you start writing the text, then you're writing the book. And that's the fun part. Um, so I'm just in an awkward, unsatisfying phase in this particular project. But yes, at least I do have an idea. So do the planning part, does that, how long would that take or does it completely depend on the subject and oh it varies a lot um yeah. with should we stay or should we go one of the reasons i wrote it so quickly is that i'd had the idea for um quite some time and so i'd already completely developed it in my head it, it, it dropped like an apple from the tree so do, and do you always, um, I know you mentioned that you like to have a clear plan before you actually start the writing, but do you always stick to that plan or have you found with any of your books, we just had this question from Hillary saying, do you stick to the plan always or have you ever found with any of your books that you've got halfway through and thought, well, actually, maybe I'll take this in a different direction? For the most part, I follow the game plan, but it's not a, some kind of rule. Um, once I got to the middle of Big Brother, I realized that I was not happy with the ending I had planned. Um, so it wasn't a matter of getting to the ending and then realizing that I wanted to do something different. I could already feel it, that this is not making me happy where we're driving. And uh, so I, I changed my mind. And that meant I was going in a different direction. And anyone who's read that book will know what I'm talking about. Excellent. Well, we sat very sadly running out of time, but um, just want to say a massive thank you to, to you, Lionel. It's been absolutely fascinating and um, it's a great book. So I thoroughly recommend a, a read of it, but thank you very much. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.